How many of you know what a good four-letter Italian word is for goodbye? Ciao? No. Bang. Okay. Preacher said some of the folks out there may not be laughing because you're too rapid-fire Yankee and they can't follow it so good. And they're not even catching them. So let me give you another one. Uh, how many of you know why Italians wear gold chains all the time? They have to know where to stop shaving. Say amen right there. Hey, you were right. He was right. Say amen right there. Mrs. Crockett was a staff member, or was she on staff? Was she, the high she was in the high school when my daughter was a teenager. And my daughter got kicked out of the high school with a bunch of troublemakers for being at parties with drinking and smoking, all this stuff was going on. And she, my daughter was out, the, she was going out the gate bye-bye. And Miss Brenda got a hold of her and corralled her in and brought her to herself. And today my wife thinks Mrs. Crockett walks on water and she's been married to a preacher forever, pastor in three different churches together and uh, f five children. She lo my daughter loves the Lord tonight, but it's because of your preacher's wife. So make sure you appreciate what God's given you while you have her. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn over to um, Luke. I'm going to preach a real important message along a personal level tonight. Or well, this morning, I'm going to um, try to help you with your burdens. This is the number one sermon I ever preach that gets results from Christians that have struggled with heartaches. Tonight, we're going to deal with where America is tonight, a very heavy chapter about current events. Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to give you a whole history of the world for two nights to show you exactly what God's doing and where we are tonight and where we're fixing to take off to. And then Wednesday night, we're going to go crazy in here and just have a wonderful topping it off the uh, week uh, meeting. And when the meeting's over, I'm pretty much going to get in my truck and drive back to Tennessee through the night to meet my books that will already be there about two days, coming out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. So how personal can you get for you good folks? Okay, so let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 26, start, uh, uh, no, pardon me, Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about, much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art uh, careful and troubled about many things. In the Greek, it says, lighten up. Amen. Verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Father, help us this morning to sense your presence. We know you always show up, but you don't always show out. Pray you show out this week. We had a good Sunday school hour, but this is a lot. We, have, we need you every service now. We'll commit everything to thee now. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, Mary, Mary learned a, an amazing lesson here. And she also had, uh, she saw Jesus step up in her behalf and rebuke her sister nicely for her. Wouldn't you like to have the Lord stand up for you like that? Now, in order to get this sermon, you have got to understand a critical, critical truth, okay? These two women are both uh, Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern women. They're Shemite ladies. And I say Shemite, Noah had three sons. Don't forget that. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And after the Tower of Babel, when God scattered them off the Mount Ariat, they went three different directions. Go out, look, go out and get my, uh, look at my new book sitting on the table and see if I don't have a quote in there from World Book Encyclopedia 2022 edition. This edition, under the article named Noah. Go, you look, look at it. I took a picture of it with my own camera. Got it in the book where they talk about Noah's three sons and who, who these, these three boys fathered. And they'll tell you that Japheth fathered, Asia, fathered the people of Asia Minor and Europe. 
proper. Ham fathers the African people, and Shem fa uh, fa uh, fathers the Asian people. They go three different directions. All, that's in a world book encyclopedia. I mean, they don't lie all the time, the secular sources, most of the time, but here they follow Genesis 9 and 10 like a hand in a glove, okay? Now, Japheth goes, if, if you have European ancestry, you descend back to Japheth. The key to this whole sermon is understanding your spiritual DNA. Because God made prophecies about these three sons and their descendants. And what he said about your ancestors is in Genesis 9, 27. We've got to be very tight for time in the morning, so I'm skipping a lot of this stuff like the preacher said. But Genesis 9, 27, God said, he would in, God, God shall enlarge Japheth. That's what the text says. Is it any wonder that Japheth's descendants, i.e. Europeans, i.e. white people, i.e. white men, have controlled this world for centuries now? God said that that would happen. Monday and Tuesday, now I'll show you the Bible explanation for what the Lord's doing and why he's done that. But the key to the whole thing can be wrapped up in a silly Italian joke. Can you believe that? Ready? You did real good a minute ago. Don't let me down again. Ready? How do you break up an Italian wedding? Somebody yells, the cement's here. <laughs> Unless you've lived in a big eastern city, you might not understand it, but the Italians run the construction industries. Amen? Uh, Rodney Dangerfield, and by the way, that joke has got a double entendre punchline to it because the Italians use cement for other things too, you know what I mean? You know why Italians have short necks? All the time they stand in front of the judge. I never heard of the guy. I don't know nothing about that guy. Rodney Dangerfield, the Jewish comedian, said his neighborhood in New York was so tough when the little kids were playing the, the wet cement, you know, they put their hand in there, sometimes they feel another hand, amen. <laughs> All right. What's that joke got to do with every, anything? Everything. God said he was going to enlarge Japheth, not Shem and not Ham. See, that's a hate crime. All people aren't the same. God was going to use Japheth's descendants as the enlarged race. And that's what all this charge of white supremacy and white privilege. You had a problem with that. Go talk to God. He put that in the Bible a long time ago. But you've got to get the spiritual explanation for it that you never hear anybody talking about. I'll give you that Monday night. But all that to say this, about Shem, it said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Shem's line are going to be connected to religion and non-materialistic things. That's why the three largest monotheistic religions in the world, Christianity, Judaism, and even nutty Islam, all come out of Shemites, Eastern people. Europeans were always polytheistic, worshiping many gods, Thor and Hercules, and, and the Pantheon in Rome, you know, m multiple gods. Shemites weren't like that, Japheths are. Japhethites are materialistic, Shem is spiritual. Now, in, in this story, even though both women were, were Asian women per se, their personalities are so different, they, they, they give a good object lesson to the main idea of this sermon. Martha is running around like a chicken with her head cut off, right? Well, she's a picture of, of a Japhethite personality. And Mary is just sitting there, look, staring at Jesus, being accused almost by being a deadbeat by her busy sister Martha. But Jesus defends Mary, doesn't he? Now, that's a great truth. Now, here's the deal. 95% of you probably have European ancestors, right? Well, that means you're a Japhethite by instinct, by DNA. America was built with Japhethites. And it's a Japhethite-minded culture we have. Hello? Hello? Is bigger, better? My house is bigger than your house. My wife's prettier than your wife. I make more money at my job than you do. My car is cooler than your car. Is that America? Bigger is better? That's America. We're the builders. God said that he was going to enlarge Japheth. Does that make sense to you? Now watch this, neighbor. You've got that in your subconscious back here. Every one of you. And Satan exploits you through that weakness of thinking that way, even if subconsciously. You can't help it. It's kind of in your blood. 
But I tell preachers about this all across this country. Preacher, they get intimidated if their church is not growing as fast as they want it to, or they judge their success by how big their church is. You, you normal human beings judge your personal success by how big your house might be or how much money you make. Or you're, you're, you're bombarded with that thinking your whole life. And then you're going to get to the judgment seat one time and find out Paul was right when he said, uh, every man's work shall be tried of what sort it is, not what size it is. Hello. You know what I tell preachers all across America? I said, you're a Japhethite, all right, right? But the problem you don't realize is your boss is a Shemite. Hello? What's the bumper sticker say? You've seen it. I work for a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth. And Shem does not think like Japheth thinks. The, the personality that Jesus had in his life was almost a reflection of the Shemite person. He's an Asian. He's a Middle East person. Uh, yeah, how many remember Kung Fu growing up? A grasshopper. That, that's God's personality. <laughs> He don't get excited about the things we get excited about. Here's Mary just sitting there again doing nothing on paper. And Martha's all bent out of shape and the Lord says, leave her alone. She's giving me something that I need. But Japheth doesn't think that way. Japheth's always running around doing the things that need to be done. Churches are busy. An old preacher said the average church is usually too over-organized and under-agonized. Moving, 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 trying to move on to bigger things. Kabish, now watch this. What's that, Lord? They need another Italian joke. What's the most, com what's the most common expression you hear at an Italian funeral? If he'd only kept his mouth shut. Amen. Turn over to Matthew real quick. Matthew 26. Ha, ha, ha. By the way, I tell, I tell these jokes because the men like them. Any man that doesn't like my jokes has probably got a problem. Amen. <laughs> Amen, Brother Grady. Matthew 26. Now, Mary learned something there in that story, and she's going to take it up to the next level. By the way, you husbands are uh, got a Japhethite personality mostly, and a wife a lot of times will have a Shemite personality. You, you men, you know what you want to, you know what you buy your wife on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Valentine's Day? If I stutter, that's my Joe Biden impersonation, by the way. You know what you guys want to buy? Your, the average guy buys his wife on Valentine's Day a, a toaster, amen, a four, a four slicer, amen, because you're tired of the two slicer. And you know, you, you think practically, but your wife, she wants a dozen roses, say amen right there, because they don't make any sense. They'll be dead in about six days. And I've preached this sermon sometime over a 20 year period, come back to a church 20 years later, and then some of the wives will say, I'll take the toaster, amen. <laughs> That's true. All right, now Mary, Mary learned something from what she went through with the Lord, right? And she's going to ratchet it up to the next level. So uh, look at Matthew 26. Here she is in, in Bethany. Uh, the Schofield note tells you uh, Jesus anointed by Mary of Bethany. It doesn't name her in the text, but you can figure out it's Mary, uh, not Mary Magdalene, not Mary the mother of Jesus. It's Mary, the sister, sister of Martha and Lazarus. And you get that by reading the other accounts in Mark and John that tell this story, right? Here, she's not named. But watch what happens. Now, this is a cool sermon, and I've got to suppress it a little bit, so you're going to have to listen quick. Verse 6, Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. Don't miss it. It didn't say ointment. It didn't say precious ointment. It said very precious ointment. Stay with me. We are so going somewhere with this sermon. If you just stay with me, and if you ever wanted some help about your heartbreaks, you'll get it this morning if you just pay attention. And poured it on his head as he sat at me. Watch the next verse. Look at two buzzwords that pop up. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? I went and preached in Florida one time, flew down with my wife, and we got to, we got to the car luggage carousel, and, and the whole area, we got our suitcases out, the whole area smelled like a, a, like a perfume smell. I thought I was in San Francisco airport. Say amen right there. I was in Florida. 
and I walked down the terminal halls. I smelled that all over the place. Got into the van they sent to pick us up to church. It was in the van, preacher. Walked through the hotel lobby. It was everywhere. I didn't know what was. I thought I was in the twilight zone. Got in the elevator. It was in the elevator. Got to my room. It was in my room. Help me, Jesus. Opened up my wife's suitcase, and there was a big bottle of perfume that had burst in the airplane. Amen. Her, some of her clothes were ruined, but it was okay. She had five more trunks coming down the hallway. No, she did. I'm just kidding. Hey, that's, that aroma filled up the room, and Mary broke it open. And, uh, but then, it, then the disciples got bent out of shape. And if you'll read John, you'll find that it was Judas, the treasurer, that was bent out of shape. For this ointment could have been sold for much and given to the poor. Verse 8, verse 9. You think Judas gave a flip about the poor? Verse 10. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman for? Watch it now. She hath wrought a good work. Don't miss the next two words. Upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment, hello, on my body, she did it for my burial. She's showing a picture of his coming passion. Now how important was this story to the Lord? Verse 13, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. The Lord said that 2,000 years ago, and look what's happening today. You're hearing again. Just like he said, 2,000 years this story has been per perpetuated. And Charles Spurgeon was on a train, the famous preacher. He's riding in first class one time. And some Pharisee minister came up to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I ride second class and save the Lord's money. Spurgeon said, I ride first class and save the Lord's servant. Take a, take a, take a hike, amen. That's what the Lord was saying. You have the poor always. You don't have me forever. Now what's this got to do with anything? Oh, everything. Everything. Somebody said life can be illustrated by a golf game. Any of you people crazy enough that you like golf? I, I hate golf because I can't hit the ball. And I'm always, I've only been out a few times, man. People coming up behind me, where'd the preacher go? He's hiding back here. You know, the people come up behind you, you know, watching you missing the ball. That, that embarrasses me. I hate golf. I don't even like putt-putt golf, amen. But somebody said you can uh, illustrate life with an 18-hole golf course. The front nine and the back nine holes. You know, your whole life, okay? Now watch this. I'm, I got to go fast, I'm telling you. Uh, the, front nine, the front holes, like the first, second and first hole, we in your know, delivery room, amen? Second and third hole, though, little dweeby kids. That early part of your life, remember how it was? It's illustrated like this, look. Dreams. Goals. Planning. How many of you? How many of you ladies? When you were little, you said, "I can't wait till I can grow up and marry a chainsaw killer." Amen. Anybody like that crazy? You, you're always you always think marrying a prince charming, right? You young men were dreaming about being successful in sports. I guess you know his nickname was Ro Rocket the Crockett, you know, or Crockett the Rocket. I mean, when he was in college, you know, his football passes. Amen. Did you ever tell them that? How many of you? How many of you heard that? Is this the first time you've heard it? Boy, you, you owe me that hundred bucks back up again on that offering. He was so good in football, they called him Crockett the Rocket. That's a true story. Amen. Ask his wife. Amen. Blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, you, you're a young preacher, you know, about uh, fifth hole. You're dreaming about uh, going to some big city and winning the city to the Lord. That's normal. It's just, especially as a Japhethite, you're planning on building something. You're a young man, you're not in the ministry, you're going to build a successful business or have a career of some kind so you can give money to the church. And Okay, that's normal, isn't it? All right, come on down to the back nine holes. The last holes of your life, the 15th and 16th and 17th hole, you know where they cheat in golf? Nobody cheats in the beginning. They start cheating to get close to the end of the game. You know what this, you know what this part of your life is characterized by? Reality. It was dreams down there, wasn't it? Remember? This is adjustment. This is it. You ladies been married to the same guy for 40 years sitting next to you? It won't get any better than what's sitting next to you. Say amen right there. Is that all there is, my friend? 
I don't remember fiddler on a row on the roof. I don't remember growing older. I'll be 70. Don't get shocked. No way I look 70. There's no way I look 70. Next in November, I'll be 70. Where did it go, bro? Kabish, a lot of older people here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. There's your 18 holes of life. Now, here's the, uh, here's the, here's the key to the sermon. Look, because if we're European by descent, you're Japhethite in your head, building, trying to, be bigger is better, and God will enlarge Japheth, and, and that's in your thinking. If I, if, I, if I don't have something to show for my success, I'm a failure. Are you all with me? Okay, Satan knows that's in your subconscious brain, and he lays you out with, with your own weakness if you don't understand where this sermon is going to end in a few minutes. Trust me. It'll change your life if you can get it. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? You know, God's a Shemite. He has the Shemite mindset. He, he don't care. Preacher, he loves you or people, but he's not holding his breath to see if you're going to build a big church for him. He's wanting to know how much truth you're going to preserve here for him. Go read over there in Isaiah 66. Where is the house that you're building to me? The Lord, they're going to build a temple to, for, for, you know, in, for Solomon you know, in the Old Testament. And the Lord says, that's nice, yawn. I use the earth for a footstool. But I guess it's okay. Sure. You think you're going to impress God with anything? He don't need you. He needs your fidelity, your loyalty. I went out of that Marine Corps base last night, and the last guy was a Marine standing there. I said, Semper Fi. Always faithful. That's what God wants. Now, because God is like that, you know what he does? I'm going to explain your Christian life for you right this second. Along your 18 holes of life, God will factor in a little percentage, preacher, of waste. What purpose was this waste, they said, when Mary poured that ointment on the Lord? Because it was true, it was waste. Because that's what you do to a dead body. He was alive. It could have been sold and the money given to the poor, maybe. Had no practical purpose pouring that on him when he was alive. It was a waste. And God factors into your life and my life along the trail some kind of waste. Oh, maybe you make a bad business, business decision, some of you men. Put your, hurt your family's finances. Somebody's child goes bad. Somebody's wife goes off with another man. God allowed that. He didn't cause it. Greatest sermon I ever heard Jack House preach. He preached, drew a big circle, and he put a dot in the middle of the circle and an arrow coming into the circle, pointing toward the dot. Greatest sermon I ever heard on practical things. That circle is a picture of God. If you're saved, the dot represents you. How many times are you going to read in the Bible, you're in Christ, you're hid in God, before you may believe that? And the arrow is something negative Satan's coming after you with. Do you notice the arrow can't touch the dot until it comes through the circle? The oldest book in the Bible is Job. How do you like my servant Job? I don't know. I can't touch him. You've got a hedge around him. Take the hedge down. Let me tear him up a while and see what happens. God says, okay. It's called the hedge principle. Do I have to tell you about Stonewall Jackson? He said he felt as comfortable on a battlefield as he did in his own bed. When it's his time, it'll be his time. God controls everything. That arrow is a picture of the devil coming in to hurt you, but it has to be with God's permission. Nothing happens to you without God controlling it. Now, with that in mind, the Lord is allowing all of this waste at different times of your life, and because you are a Japhethite by lineage, you think that those are times in your life where you're failing. You're a failure. Preacher, if I only hadn't made that mistake and lost those people in the church, my church could be this much bigger than it is today. Every pastor in America thinks that way because Satan puts those thoughts into his head. In other words, if you're, if you're not growing, if you're not successful, you're a flop. And God causes you to have many times in your life where you flop big time when it wasn't always your fault. Many times it's not your fault. Hey, that daughter of yours that got pregnant in the back seat of a car, couldn't God have sent somebody by, a, a policeman, a little flashlight at the last minute, and broke that thing up before anything happened? Well, sure God could have. Did he? No. 
Now the question is, why does God allow that? Let me tell you a story real quick. Uh, I, I'm saving time. I'm not having you turn to it. It's over in 1 Samuel, uh, uh, but we won't turn to it. I'll tell it to you real quick. So I was preaching in a church in South Carolina one year on a, on a Sunday night preacher, and before the service started, the pastor pointed out a young couple sitting off to the left. This was a Sunday night. The previous uh, Monday... They'd walked into their, two, they had two teenage kids. They were waking them up to go to, get ready to go to, on the bus for summer camp. The, the girl was up and around, preacher, but their 12-year-old son was dead. This dead. 12 years old. No note, no explanation, but their mom and dad was Sunday night in church faithful. Don't you think Satan was telling that mom and dad what purpose was this waste? We, we have to lose your 12-year-old son for for no reason. You know, and when I was at the book table at the end of the service, I, I, I was trying to comfort them, and I talked to the wife and the husband together, and I took them to 1 Samuel 16. And that's the, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel 6. That's the story where the Philistines wanted to send the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel because they were getting judged by God for having it, right? And they put it in a wagon, a cart with a bunch of jewels in the cart. You know, like pay off some, you know, interest to the Lord for the time that they had it, right? You know, the last minute before they, they, they let the money go, somebody got to thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if this was just coinky dinky? A chance was the Bible word they used that all this judgment came on us and it wasn't God doing it to us. We're going to get rid of all this money for nothing. And so they said, let's try something out. And they wanted to do an experiment. So they got the two mama cows, milch kind. I'm a city slicker, so I don't know what all that means. But to put them in the harness with the wagon, right? And took their two babies or however many baby calves they had and put them in, you know, the barn like, like over here. Israel's that direction. And then they turn them loose and they say, let's see which way mama goes. If it's not God judging us, and this is all a coinky dinky, the mamas will you turn and go back to the babies, won't they? But if God's involved with this, when they turn those oxen loose, they're going to go straight to Israel, despite the fact that their babies are behind them. That's the story I'm telling his precious mother just lost her son. And you read the text, when they let him loose, they headed toward Israel. But man, you husbands, don't wait till you're married 50 years to start learning how to be a good husband. Your wife is not the same way you are. She can tell you she loves you one minute, tell you she hates you the next minute, mean it both times. Say amen right there. <laughs> Women are different than men. You all understand that? And they're on a different wavelength with you, and they're a gift from God to you, but you've got to understand them. Here's the greatest text you'll ever get in a Bible to let you know how a mother thinks, like a, a wife you're married to. It said they took off pulling that ox. Ready? It said, lowing as they went. L-O-W-I-N-G. Hello, anybody home? Elvis has left the building. You want another Italian joke? I'm sorry, there's not enough time to fit him in in the morning. Come back tonight, I'll tell you 20 more jokes. Lowing as they went. Different wavelengths. I've had ranchers explain it to me. Those mothers pulled that wagon for God even though their heart was broken at the separation with their young. And I could always cry because I remember those people. Sweet people. I told that mother, look where you are tonight in church. You could be bitter. You could say that's the way God's going to need. You understand? They're faithful to God. That's five, six years ago. That husband just ordered a final authority from me this week, preacher. I wouldn't let him pay it. Send a, send a free book to him. Now listen, neighbor. You got any waste in your life? Stuff that doesn't make any sense? If it doesn't make any sense, and it's hurtful, how, well, hey, what kind of ointment did Mary bring? Very precious ointment. You have any pre very precious things God permitted you to lose through your 18 holes and Satan exploits it and, and works on you night and day. You were not a good enough husband. If you were a better wife, your husband wouldn't have left you. If you were better parents, your kids wouldn't have messed up. Talk to me. God wants to help you. You've got to understand why God allowed that to happen. When you see that, your whole life will change overnight. In that regard, because bitterness and sorrow and heartache, that wrecks a lot of Christians' lives. They stay messed up their whole life. 
Excuse me for breathing, but this is what I do, 48 years in the ministry. You say, well, what was the purpose, preacher? Hello, ready? God wants to smell nice. I put cologne on this morning, preacher. What are you talking about? <laughs> Excuse me for breathing, but where did that ointment go? She hath wrought a good work, what? On me. That cologne went on Jesus' head, and it was identified as waste. Is that correct? What purpose was this? Waste. Do you know why God allows all that heartache in our life? Because that heartache that makes no sense, that appears as waste, that's his cologne, if you'll give it to him. He loves to smell nice. Go read Song of Solomon. Go read the Psalms. Go read where his, 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 the ointment is his perfume. Go read all those verses. I'd read them all out to you if it was a Sunday night now. It's Sunday morning. I just got to have you take my word for it. Excuse me for breathing, but do you know unsaved people in Richmond, Virginia understand this principle just like that? How about if I quote them to you? Ready? One man's trash, another man's treasure. Your waste is God's cologne. If you, if you understand it, and then you give. Mary brought her waste, her cologne to the Lord. You and I have the phone call in the middle of the night, the car wreck, where the thing is ripped out of our life, and then you just have to adjust to it and limp your whole life. And most Christians will stop going to church. The other ones will come to church and don't ask them how they're doing because they'll tell you. And they're, they're, you know, they're a shadow of what they used to be, you know. That's not what Mary did. Mary voluntarily gave her waste to the Lord, her cologne her ointment. When a saved person understands this concept, recovers themselves, drops back and punts, and you bring that waste to God, how do you do that, preacher? By obeying one of the most important verses in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. Did you ever thank, did you, you, you ladies, did you ever thank God that your husband left you? I bet your quarter you never did. You're commanded to do that. God let that husband leave you so you could bring some cologne to him. He likes to smell nice. I'm telling you, this is life-changing material if you can get it. Hey, look, look, my notes are up there in the counter. I'm just hitting the high points because of time from memory, but uh, hello. You know what the key to this whole sermon is? Is finding out where all those tears went where all those tears went when you had all those heartaches hit. Uh, a couple of years ago, on Valentine's Day, preacher, February 14th, I was in New York, I think Palmyra, New York. I preached this sermon on a Sunday morning, and a big old dude walked up to my book table. He was big, and he wasn't smiling. I thought he didn't like my sermon. I was ready to ask him, what part do you want me to retract? <laughs> he come up to me, and you know what he said? He said, Brother Grady, my daughter, married daughter, died of a drug overdose one year ago today on Valentine's Day last year, died in her bed with two of her children sleeping next to her. My grandkids, they took her dead body off the bed later that morning when they found out she was dead. And you know what that man said? That man said, I never shed one tear all year until this morning. And he said, I shed a bunch of them in the, sitting in the pew. Now, that's not normal. Most of us shed the tears throughout the tragic time, right? Do you ever, know, you ever want to know what happened to all those tears? What do you think happened to them? David told you what happened to them, didn't he? Blah, blah, blah. I'm looking here. I'm skipping all my notes here. Look at this. Blah, blah, blah. They're here somewhere. Uh, yeah. Psalm 56, uh, uh, Psalm 56 says, uh, um, verse 10, are not all, the, all thy tear, all my tears in a bottle, David said. Remember that? Anybody home? You know where your tears went when you had all your tragedies? My mother killed herself when I was 11 years old. I remember right in front of me, I remember being at the casket before they shipped the body to New Hampshire for burial, and I didn't go on the, sh on the train. It was my last goodbye at the funeral home is the chance to, the, for the people to, you know, have your last moment. Just family now in the funeral home, just five, 10 of us. 
And when it was my turn, I looked down at my mother like that, took one of those little funeral cards, you know, in memory of so-and-so, you know, and I felt so stupid. I'm an 11-year-old Catholic boy, never saw a Catholic Bible. I don't know anything about God. And, I, and I'm looking around, no one is, I don't want anybody to see this. And I leaned over to my mother and I said, Mom, I don't know how you're going to do this, but one day you're going to give this back to me. And I stuffed that card in the casket, leaned down and kissed her, and my tears were filling that casket. Not, haven't you had situations like that? Where'd those tears go? God's got a bottle. Why has he got a bottle? Hello? I told you, he wants to smell nice. I took my cologne bottle out of my shaving kit right before I left for church this morning and put some cologne on. Well, God's no different than me. See, his cologne are your tears. And it's sitting in a bottle in heaven. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. The problem is the cap is on the bottle. And God will never use that cologne, preacher, until you give him the okay to do it. He's not a Calvinist. He just won't take it. It's your tears. He's just saved them. He's dying for you to say, go ahead and use it. Because that's what he had them to shed for. Our waste is his cologne. And that's where Mary's ointment went. Look, look. Do I have to go out of my way to get your attention maybe for somebody tonight? Can you get any closer to God than being on him? That's where Mary's ointment went. And it was the waste of the story. You've got your waste, just like that ointment was wasted on the floor. You know what a real waste is? If it did, doesn't get to where the Lord wants it to go, on his person. Anybody getting this or... I guess I've preached this sermon a zillion times across America and always changes the lives of so many people because I get the feedback later. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. Whatever your waste is along the trail, if you've not thanked God for that, and I mean really heavy. I don't mean you got used to living without the thing. You adjusted. I'm not talking about any of that. Thank God you're still in church. But that's not what we're talking about. You've got to thank the Lord for that waste. And when you do that, boy, God gets happy because now he gets that beautiful cologne that he's wanted all along, which is your tears. Now let me close with this, preacher. I wouldn't go any, I won't go past 10 after. Let me close with this. There was a preacher when I was a teacher. Did I ever have you for any classes? I mean, did you have me for classes? Oh, he was afraid to take my classes for credit because I had a pretty rough reputation, didn't I? He sneaks in there for audit. In other words, he don't, I, he don't have to take a test. But I had, a, I had a black preacher in my evening college class. He had a church in Chicago. And he, I forget his name. He asked me if I would preach for his church one Sunday. And I came down there... In bad neighborhood, bad, bad Leroy Brown territory, southern, south Chicago is rough. Sunday morning service, packed out church. Everybody in there was a black Christian, packed out house. And I taught this material in Sunday school, in everything give thanks. And then disappeared with the preacher back in his little office. Then came out 15 minutes later for the morning service. And right before I got to preach, the pastor introduced a lady to come up and sing the special, right? He said, before we, Brother Grady preachers, Sister Anthony is going to bless us with a song, right? This tall black lady in the back of the auditorium stands up, big old hat on her head. She said, Brother Pastor, something like that. She said, before I sing, may I give a word of testimony? And I still remember, that's over 20 years ago, I still remember what that preacher said. He said, say on... Sister Anthony, say on. And then the tears began flowing down her face. And she said, I heard Brother Grady's Sunday school lesson on In Everything Give Thanks. And she said, it's not easy to thank God when your 16-year-old baby girl gets dragged down a back alley in Chicago, hanging out of a car, head bobbing on the, bouncing on the cobblestones, 
and gets dumped out of the car at the end of the alley and left there dead in a drug deal gone bad two weeks ago. But this morning, after the lesson, I got down here on my knees back here for the first time. I thank the Lord that he allowed my daughter to die in that terrible situation. And then she just walked down the wall, just like this, to come up to sing, and we're all going. And she got behind the pulpit, and she said, this morning, I wish to bless the church in song by singing an old hymn entitled, I'm coming up the mountain on the rough side. And then, man, preacher, she sang, and everybody, we, we all blacked out, man. I got up to preach, and I don't even remember what I preached on. But, man, she, the Lord had already met with us. You know how much cologne the Lord got when that old lady, that mama said, thank you, Lord. She wasn't glad that her child was killed. But does the Bible say, in everything, give thanks? Is that what it says? Hello, do you thank your boss for a paycheck that you earned? No. Should you thank him for a Thanksgiving Christmas turkey bonus, maybe? Yes. Well, the Lord said, in everything, give thanks, because everything that's ever happened to you, God sent it to you or permitted it to happen. So that's why you thank him. And listen, about 95% of the saved people in this world that go through heartaches never thank God for the heartache. They never think to do that. And all that time, that cologne is sitting in that bottle, and the Lord's not getting to use it, because you never gave him the okay to take the, the lid off and use it. Well, how do I do that again? By thanking him. I'm going to close with this. I was in South Carolina, I don't know, two years ago, driving around, going to another church, and I remembered that man and his wife that lost that little boy from suicide. And I, got, I prayed for them while I was driving. They didn't know I was in the area. Then I got to my motel room, and only God can do these wild things. There was a text on my phone, Pastor, from, the, from that husband. He didn't know I was in town. How could you make up something like that? Can I tell you what his text says? Dear Brother Grady, this was September 19th, 2017. I just saw the date. You took your time after the service at such and such a church in such and such a town to speak to me and my wife. Just wanted to let you know the words you spoke to me and my wife after our 12-year-old boy committed suicide has helped us more than you will know. Don't miss this. We continue to pull forward. Lowing. Lowing, all capital letters, L-O-W-I-N-G. Lowing as we go without our sweet boy. Thank you for taking time to help us. Guess how much cologne the Lord got when that couple understood that great truth and thanked them. God doesn't mind you lowing as long as you're pulling. He knows your, your heart's broken. But don't forget why God has permitted that waste in your life. Because our waste is his cologne. Excuse me. Our waste is his cologne, potentially his cologne. Because you've got to give it to him. And I'm telling you, neighbor, most Christians, even when they learn this truth, don't want to do that. Preacher, they've spent so much time learning how to adjust to a, I hate to put it this way, like a mournful spirit in their life. They don't want to thank the Lord. You know how good this principle works? This principle works for anything. You get a flat, tire, a flat tire, you get a speeding ticket, you get some crazy thing that normally make you want to cuss, you know, and frustrated. Just say, thank you, Lord, for the speeding ticket, and you'll get a peace that'll come over you. Because until you do that, you feel frustrated because the devil says, you jerk, you idiot, you did it. But God gives you a, an escape patch. When you thank him for it, you're reminding yourself that he was involved with it. That's what it means in Peter when it says, casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. The way you do that is drag him into your fiasco by reminding yourself that he was involved. Thank you, Lord. It, I used to preach this sermon 20 years ago. I called it God's Rolade. God, God's Rolades. 
or go heavenly Rolades or Tums or something like that. Because you take those antacid pills usually and you feel relief pretty quick, mostly instantaneously, don't you? That's what happens when you give thanks to God for something that's got you tore up. And I've learned it, preacher. Listen, I'm going to confess now, okay? I've learned how, how it works 100% of the time, and I'll have something happen, preacher, that I get mad about, and the Holy Spirit will say, why don't you thank me for it? And I know how good it works, and I refuse to thank him. Because I won't, because he'll take the burden off me, and I like to be in a bad mood sometimes. Don't look at me like that. You're messed up too, amen. Preachers aren't perfect. We're all messed up. You're just more messed up than we are. We'd be out of a job, amen.